My name is Mark Eddy. I'm uh, from the NYU College of Dentistry, so I think I had a little variation here in the mix. <laughs> I'm a clinical psychologist and, uh, and a father. So uh, today I'm going to talk about fathers, but specifically about reentry. And uh, as we've been talking about today, incarceration in the U.S. does affect a huge amount of people in our country, men and women. And, uh, but 92% of parents in prison are dads. And just to put a perspective on what that means, if you incarcerated everybody that lived in the city of Seattle, where I've worked for the last five years, or everybody who lives in the city of San Francisco, that's how many dads are in prison. The demographics of these dads, as we've been talking about, 40% African-American, 30% non-Hispanic white, 20% Hispanic. About half of these dads were primary financial supporters of their families prior to being incarcerated. And um, as uh, Danielle mentioned, about 88% of the dads, uh, their kids are living with the mother in the community. And almost 80% of the fathers have had some contact with their kids. So there are a lot of dads that are not connected to their children, uh, or some of their children, but there are a lot of fathers that are connected to at least one or more of their kids. When we think about prison in the US, especially if you're my age, you think more about kind of movies like uh, Birdman of Alcatraz or Cool Hand Luke or you know this kind of what prisons were like in the old days. This is Alcatraz. And uh, there was a transition point in the early 70s when, when state different changes in state policies and locking up more people really drove uh, the rise of incarceration, as we've talked about. And that's really changed what people are like in prison. It's kind of changed from a focus on a population that not, not in all cases, but was really tif typified by people who were uh, chronically criminal convicts, as one of my colleagues used to talk about them, to a population that really has a wide variety of problems that are linked. It's not that they aren't committing crimes, as has been talked about today, but this broad set of other problems are also on the table and important to think about. When I was flying through Newark yesterday, I looked over and saw the new building that's there, and uh, I was thinking that 15 years ago, about on this day, I was standing in a room that had about this many people, but every person in the room was a father who was in for life. And these dads were having a difficult time because the uncertainty, talk about uncertainty, that got introduced by 911 was huge in prisons because people didn't know what was gonna happen next. One of the only contacts that <coughs> happened every day in this particular prison that I was in uh, with the outside world was planes flying overhead and no planes had flown over for a couple of days. If you remember, they shut down the airspace after 911. And <coughs> in prison, uh, guys who are in for life have usually have a really hard time for a while, but then you either have to get it together or you fall apart. And so some of the social leaders in prison are people who are in for life. And one of the guys in this group was kind of the lawyer guy, played the lawyer role. And he, very bright guy, if he wasn't in prison, I think he'd just probably be a political leader somewhere. And uh, he was convinced that everybody was gonna get shot in their cell if we went to war. And uh, of course, that day was supposed to be a parenting group, but it wasn't about parenting group. And so uh, anyway, the uncertainty is something I've been thinking about. But just the other day, I was driving through Idaho. I live in Oregon, but work in New York City, believe it or not, but, uh, <clears throat> and drove by an institution that looked like this one, and I was, didn't know the name, and I was reading about it on my phone, and it was describing the beautifully landscaped institution and all kinds of stuff. And I'm thinking that isn't the experience that you have when you're locked up as a dad in one of these. So as has been talked about, um, reentry is a, is a process that people go through many, many times in many different ways in the criminal justice system. And this is just plotting uh, dads who are released from prison and what's the likelihood that they're gonna be rearrested 
and then have other things happen to them. And you can see by the time we get to five years out in this cohort that almost 80% uh, had experienced some additional contact with police arrest, including who knows what after that. So given that uh, recidivism is a big issue, that people are going to prison, and we as a society are spending a lot of time locking people up, but a lot of people then go back and have much long-term involvement with the criminal justice system, what could we do? So here's some possible consequences. We could change policies and practices related to correlates of crime, like poverty and all kinds of other social issues that are related to crime. Uh, we could change policies and practices related to arrest, sentencing, and the whole continuum that we've talked about. We could change policies and practices related to reentry. These are all possibilities, and the place that our uh, country seems to be talking about right now and why this particular chapter was really interesting and important, I think, to work on was that reentry seems to be where it's at at the moment, and uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. So uh, what do we know about what helps fathers the most at reentry? A lot of it is, a, is around personal experience. If we had a different group of people here today, there would probably be a number of people in the room here who were quite charismatic and had had some really important experiences happen to them of how they got out of crime and they talk about it and their experiences are legitimate and valuable. The question is, do they translate to other people and how do we bring those to other people? So certainly in the reentry movement, there's a strong kind of, I was there, I've been there, this is how, how to work, how, how to make things work. There's a lot of quasi-experimental research work out there, which is very valuable in many different ways, but it raises more questions than answers. And there's a lot of non-peer-reviewed analyses So there's this knowledge gap that we have. <laughs> we know a lot about people who s come in and stay in programs. We know a little bit about people who don't enroll in programs. We know pretty much almost nothing about people who come into programs and leave because they don't end up in evaluations. So what's a more desirable information source than we have in reentry? And despite the fact that uh, randomized controlled trials are very controversial and corrections for a variety of reasons. I, would, I chose to focus on the RCT, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. What happens in an RCT? We randomize a sufficient number of people to a couple of conditions. We follow the outcomes of all the participants over time, and then we examine the differences between the conditions uh, with analyses that are true to the initial randomization. So what I tried to do in my search was to go out and see what do we know about fathers with this type of data source. And because personally I feel that the question of, about what works in the evidence-based practice movement is a very vacant one, and in fact we've talked about that today in a variety of ways, I went back to one of my favorite papers from 1967, <laughs> which is what program delivered by whom is most effective for a given individual with a specific problem and under what set of circumstances? If we could answer that question in reentry, we could go a long ways. And that tells us something about what we could do to help somebody that's in front of us. For me, telling me that a program works tells me nothing. Sorry to be critical, but that's where I'm starting from. So um, first of all, there's the issue of theory. So hopefully, in the ideal world, a randomized trial is built on both developmental theory about how somebody ended up in a specific situation and an intervention theory about, okay, we know we're there. How do we get back from that? What can we do differently? So in uh, corrections and in uh, sociology and all the different fields we've talked about, there's a wide variety of different theories, but just to kind of throw my hand out there, uh, for 25 years, I worked at Oregon Social Learning Center and in Eugene, and so uh, coercive family process theory is where I come from. And uh, over the years, at the beginning of the work that we did there, it was very much in the moment focused on behaviors, but because of work by Bronfenbrenner and other folks, we really have expanded that theory to include an ecological focus. So I'm very thankful for the work that happened here at Cornell related to that. Uh, in terms of intervention models, 
in reentry, there tends to be a great focus on the issue of cognitive thinking errors, that people who are locked up think in the wrong way. And they commit errors that the rest of us don't think about. Now, the problem that I've had with that is if you read about the errors they commit, they're errors all of us commit all the time. But anyway, that's the prevailing model. And there's another model, which is this risk needs responsivity model, which basically says go at the highest risk group. So if there's a really high risk group, you find out your needs and you go for them. That's the group you're working at. So those are kind of the intervention models that in reentry are kind of driving how people think about things. So um, RCTs ideally <coughs> let you do two things. They, uh, you have experimental control over something, which we often don't have at all in this field. And secondly, uh, they are an opportunity, if you think about them right, to test developmental and intervention models, not the whole thing, but bits of those models. So, in our review, the criteria that we used, we went for peer-reviewed reports published in professional journals in the past 20 years. The randomized tri trials conducted in the U.S., all participants were adults. We decided at the beginning that most participants in the study needed to be men and most fathers, and that the program that we were looking at was conducted either during the lockup time in jail and prison and or afterwards and that the intent was to impact some kind of behavior upon release and that an intent to treat kind of analysis was done. And so we did a search in EBSCO, which accesses 400 databases, and in Google, and we had about 15 different search terms that we ran through uh, in various combinations to try to find everything that we could. And we went through lots and lots of studies, but eventually found 44 articles of 35 studies that appeared to be good candidates, and then after going through coding, that got down to 23 articles and 15 studies. Uh, we had two independent coders. Uh, we were looking at specifically re-entry program content and process research design and study findings. So first of all, what did we find? Not one paper that we read specified a developmental model. None. So this is a problem. Uh, most studies referred to some kind of intervention model, but it usually was something like a little a sentence about thinking errors or something like that, or the need to, to use an RNR kind of model. That was usually about it. Uh, the basics, 87% of the studies that we found included some kind of community-based component, and about half include a prison-based component. Very few RCDs have been done in jail. About half of the program's participation in the program was voluntary, and about half it was mandatory. So that's not an issue that we've talked about much today, although it's been referred to a little bit. But despite the fact that participation in the research might be voluntary, participation in the program may not be. And there, are, there is a meta-analysis on that issue, by the way, that's of interest I could tell you about. Um, Program goals, so what we did is we used kind of a qualitative process to have themes emerge about what the goals were about the programs, and these are the five themes that we came up with. Programs address basic needs, develop social capital, develop some type of skills, coordinate services, and enhance supervision, criminal justice supervision. So those are the five goals that emerged, and you can see the percentage of studies that had each of those goals. And you can see that most programs usually had three or more goals. So uh, about, uh, you know, only, only a few had all five goals, but most, most programs were multimodal, goal-natured anyway. So in terms of address basic needs, what did we find? Well, uh, Drug treatment was the most common thing, inpatient or outpatient kind of drug treatment. Um, about 40% of programs dealt with other basic needs like housing and employment, but it usually was trying to help people find housing or find employment. Very rarely was their transitional housing provided unless it was related to residential treatment, and then when you got out of treatment, you were out of the house. Um, and only one study had subsidized program uh, around employment. And, uh, and only one study even considered the issue of how do you get around. You're, you're out in a city, 
you're trying to find a job, you have no money, how do you get around? So one study had bus passes. So basic needs, although they're often addressed, are not addressed in a comprehensive way. Uh, develop social capital. So probably the most primary way to do that was to get folks going to AA or NA type groups, self-help community, and there's certainly uh, value that I've found in my own experience by talking to people that have really felt good about those groups, but there's many people that don't benefit from those groups as well. So anyway, that, the, the social capital issue is often bringing people together with other people who are struggling with the same issues. Uh, very rarely was there a link to try to build social capital around family, and as Joyce mentioned, there's a, a great focus right now on trying to bring families in. Uh, <coughs> develop skills, cognitive skills, as I've mentioned, is kind of the popular way to go, or some kind of life skills training. Employment readiness is kind of helping people do a resume and that kind of stuff, but usually not more than that, so there's some deficiencies in this area. Coordinating services is usually done at the in individual level, but what's interesting here is almost never was it done at the community level because bringing these different resources together around these folks is really important, but that's really ignored. One thing that I've often heard about and have been involved in developing but only showed up in one of these studies was having a service hub, kind of a one-stop shop where you go to get services. Uh, often there's the PO is there as well as all kinds of other services. That's only been looked in one of these studies. Um, and then enhancing supervision. So this was the least frequently done thing, and you know they're in a system where there's lots of supervision, but, but as many of you know who work in this system, the system is overloaded, and the caseloads that POs have are huge, and so providing more supervision seems like it might be a good thing, especially if it was supportive supervision, but that was rare, rarely looked at. So in terms of my great interest, which was this Gordon Paul's question from the paper I mentioned, uh, which I'd be happy to share with you if you'd like, uh, I did classify, and uh, in my coding partner classified each study by what treatment by whom for this individual for that specific problem for which set of circumstances, and what we came up with was 15 different combinations. <laughs> so nothing replicated. Um, so the study characteristics, uh, about 400 people in each of these studies, most studies, uh, most of the studies were all men, but what was interesting is that fatherhood was only mentioned at all in 13% of studies, and the percentage of fathers in any sample was never mentioned. Most of the samples were minority, and sometimes the report was just this was a predominantly minority sample, and that's all we knew. Uh, the studies have been conducted in all regions of the country. So in terms of measures, uh, about 70% of the studies looked at program dosage. All the studies looked at recidivism, because that's what we're all obsessed with in this literature. And very few looked at other outcomes. Uh, and most common, though, was drug use and employment and housing, which, as I told you, those were often ignored in the program themselves, going back to tying what you're looking at to the curriculum. Um, an area that was particularly troubling from an RCT standpoint is, so once you randomize somebody to a condition in an RCT, in an intent to treat analysis, they're in that condition. So you want to try to give the intervention to everybody in that condition to the extent that you can. But when it was reported, uh, the average participation rate in a given component in any of these studies was 50%. The average completion rate was 40%. So you have a large number of people in these programs that are not getting the programs. And it's really challenging as a scientist in this situation because the typical control condition is services as usual, which usually includes elements that's in the program itself. So you're kind of comparing similar kind of situations which would lead to the outcomes that I'm going to show you in a minute. Outcomes. So about half the studies, if you go to the what works kind of model and or just go for significant findings, about half the studies have positive outcomes and about half don't uh, or no outcomes uh, for recidivism and for other. So that's what we know with RCTs. And you can't answer the question, can't answer the question I'm more interested in because we have no replication. Somebody did the same thing twice. So I can't tell you about all the complications that I raised there. 
So where are we in this literature right now? We're in its infancy. It's just been born. <laughs> so we need more people to help raise this child up. Uh, fatherhood is generally absent. Given the average age of men in these studies is 34 years, most likely about 60 to 75 percent of them do have kids and are partners and are in love with people and have people that love them, but we don't know anything about that from this particular literature. Uh, fathers are viewed as individuals out of context. There's no developmental theory, minimal uh, nods to intervention theory, and the multimodal programs really are kind of a person as an island concept. You individual need to work this out. And given all the discussion that's happened today so far about the many different challenges that have been noted in each of our areas, whether it's criminology, sociology, psychology, thinking about these men who are also worthy of love despite the fact that many of them have done nasty things. Uh, are not, they're not islands, but we treat them like they are islands. And there is definitely a failure to acknowledge not only basic needs, but also their relational needs. So my ending out here is that I think what really needs to happen is thinking about reentry research networks. And I think this only could happen with some sustained and coordinated commitments from funders but we have a huge number of people that we're locking up, most in the world. We have the most number of people in the world who are coming out of prison into our communities. We don't know what to do to help them. We don't know. So it's a perfect time to do randomization. We don't know what works best. Let's try some different things. And so anyway, I, I, I think that some kind of systematic and systemic effort across jurisdictions, within a state, across states, it definitely needs to be a local and state effort that the feds help on. But as people have noticed, noted, the number of people in the federal system pales in comparison to the number of people in, in our local and state systems. And then just in closing, I think when you think about all the needs that these folks have, we've locked them up, we've taken everything away, they've done their time, they're now out. The problem is we don't have enough money to deal with all those needs. And so you have to think about this issue of triage. And the other day, uh, I had a, one of my daughters has lived in China the last year, and she's now home, so I'm very happy. And she's working in a rural community this in Oregon. So it takes about two hours to drive there through the mountains to the coast uh, to where she's working with second grade kids. Last year it was 160 second grade Chinese kids in Kunming, China. Now it's 30 kids in Reedsport, Oregon. But anyway, I was listening to uh, Radio Lab, and if you have a, a moment as you're traveling, I strongly recommend listening to this. It's called Playing God. It was August 21st, 2016, and it's on triage. And they talk about triage in the context of Katrina and a hospital, and talk about pain, suffering, and emotion from that whole situation. It made me think a lot about this talk. And in triage, when you're faced with a decision, medical decision, you have limited resources, how do, you, how do you divide them up? So you could think about incarcerated dads uh, that providing some support will likely help them succeed. Other dads, maybe it won't help them succeed. And then there's some dads who they'll likely do okay without you. And so, we don't face these kind of questions when we do these research studies, <clears throat> but we could probably build, with enough funding from somebody, a really excellent reentry program that would never be replicated again. So the question is, when we make these things, how do we face the fact that we have limited resources? So anyway, if you get a chance and you're interested, listen to Triage on uh, Radio Lab. And uh, anyway, uh, these dads, deserve to come out and have relationships with their kids and their families. And uh, anyway, I'll leave you on that. Thank you. slide on reentry prison, reentry research networks. There was a final, you didn't address the final point. 
the coordinated commitments of funders. That, that was the one I said first, actually. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I mean, it is, it is tough. I think the, the problem is what, th that I've seen when the federal government does decide to really get into one of these issues, that the funding um, is usually uh, doesn't pay enough initial attention to where we're starting. And so we're starting here, not knowing a whole lot. There is a lot of money going in right now that's primarily paying for services through that DS, DHHS initiative. I get mixed up because in Washington it's DSHS. DHHS initiative. It's a lot of money in there going to fund services. There's not money in there going to fund really rigorous research on outcomes related to those services that we need to inform other services. So that's the problem that we have. And the commitment that I think needs to be there, and I don't think it can be done just by the public funders. I think it's the private foundations and it's individual donors as well, is to say how can we set up some kind of process that's not piecemeal because what we have right here was created in a piecemeal process. And we're not going to get anywhere. There's, uh, it's not going to go anywhere. Because frankly, if you reviewed the reentry literature for 20 years before this, you'd come up with the same conclusion. So you know, here we are. So I, th I think the advantage that we have in the field right now, and it's typified by the conference and the great work that all of you did who organized this conference, is we have more people that are paying attention. And if we aren't paying attention, then it uh, would be a sad case. But given this issue of incarcerated mothers and fathers and men and women who are not parents is one of the major issues of our time. I mean, it is costing us so much money and we are devastating people's lives with this decision. We triaged out, our, our society triaged out this decision to lock up a lot of people. And that caused a lot of money going into that system and actually that I think is one of the main reasons that it's not just the sentencing decisions to lock people up more through all that activity that happened in the 70s and the 80s it's also that as those decisions were being made and we locked up more and more people spent more and more money there we have less and less money to spend for anything else and that's why you end up with folks in prison who probably shouldn't be there as the UK minister talked about but they're there for other kinds of reasons, and there's no other place for them to go, unfortunately. So, anyway, yeah. I, I, so as I've sat, listened to you guys talk today, one of the things that I've struggled with has to do with the voices of the people that we are trying to serve. Mm -hmm. And we, I know we've mentioned CBPR approaches, I know we talked about focus groups and those kinds of things. Uh, but I keep wondering if there's a place for like first, first person accounts of what the impact of this issue is on all of the groups that we've talked about, the fathers, the mothers, the children, and their caretakers as a way of kind of creating context um, for us to then think about how we springboard from there. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I I'm a clinical psychologist by training, but I function as a clinical and community psychologist, and so context continues to kind of run in my head. And so that's a question I keep having, and I, I don't know that I have the answer for that. So that's one thing I want to put out there. With respect to your presentation, um, one of the things that continues to run in my head is this, this notion of men in prison and men as a, con a social construct. So there's an issue for me that asks, you know, uh, how might we think about this notion of masculinity and its role in supporting men being successful? Because after all, they still are men. And so there are prescriptions that they have to kind of live up to, and incarceration may impact negatively their ability to do so or actually give them a skills that might not be helpful because I think of um, prisons as being places where masculinity is practiced in a very wrong way. And if you're in there for any extended period of time, you then learn that wrong way to live as a man. And what does that, do? what does that then mean for this idea of reentry? And how do we then be successful when we go into the community? So, you know, just kind of raising those kinds of issues there.
Thanks for your presentation, Mark. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, um, given that there's not data here, but that we could spend some time reflecting on the possible mediators between some of the outcomes that they're measuring, housing, employment, mental health, and children's outcomes. So what would happen if we supported um, fathers around those outcomes that they're, the reentry programs are focusing on now? And how do, how do those things, those basic needs, get us to improved child well-being? Um, I asked that question in the context of, in Minnesota, we have a number of uh, jails who are um, providing a reentry services, so like a wraparound program called um, the Reentry Assistance Program, which I know many jails are sort of doing and not evaluating. In Minnesota, the model is there are a number of community-based providers that come around the table in advance of an inmate being released to talk about these basic needs. So there's somebody there from housing, there's somebody there from child support, there's somebody there from public health. Um, fatherhood is always there's, a, there's someone there to talk about fatherhood, but it's always the last thing that gets talked about. Um, and it's interesting to me how much those other elements hinge on their success at being a father, right? Because they want to provide financially for their children, but can't get a job. They want to live with their children, but housing restrictions prevent them from being able to live with their children. Or their partner was the victim of domestic violence and therefore they're prohibited from living with their children's mother. And so I guess I'm wondering if you could just reflect on sort of how those other pieces, the outcomes that are being measured, get us to childhood well-being and where do we need to go from there? Well, Michael, you got the mic back there. You wanna springboard off of this one? Uh, I could just add, well, uh, yeah, I'll just say whatever I was gonna say and, you know. <laughs> um, so for both of the two previous presentations, I'll be very honest, I'm sitting back here and I'm so depressed. And I think that th this one in particular has got to be the most depressing talk um, I've heard in a long time. Uh, but in a way, that's a good thing though, right? Because I mean, it's depression that emerges out of the evidence, right? But what I'm, so I'm thinking of some things. So we have programs doing whatever, designed however, we have studies not on them, and even when we have studies on them, they're not very good studies, even if they use what's supposed to be the gold standard for studying them, and then we get an end of 15 studies, and then the world keeps turning. But this, of course, is true not only for the questions and issues of parental incarceration. I mean, this is true for any of <laughs> the categories of social concern and need that we're paying attention to as scholars. And this point about how we need more re research networks, we need that not only for reentry, but any of the other sets of issues um, that we're concerned with. And we have examples of this happening. We, there are field network analyses of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. There have been field network um, research projects uh, related to welfare reform. And so at least we have some models to do that. But still, it's like, this is as far as we've come. So it, 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 it is depressing <laughs> from where I sit. And then, you know, the concern or the statement, you know, there's, there's, there's money for services, but there's just not enough money for rigorous science. Well, hey, I mean, that's always been the case, right? And again, not just in this domain, but across multiple domains. And still, we haven't figured out how to convince philanthropies, government, to take serious the need for rigorous social science. But then, of course, it becomes chicken and egg because we don't have rigorous social science to demonstrate the folks that it's worth the investment. So just sort of these things off the top of my head. So as a question, are there any programs that you found, and this, this applies also to, to Danielle and Rebecca, are there any programs that are out there that you found or know about that are somewhat intentionally built from or informed by scholarship? And if not, is it, should it not be incumbent upon scholars to become and function as co-producers with communities of programs that draw from whatever the best of our knowledge is at that time? Yeah, 
I mean, certainly Marx, um, I'll let Mark talk about Marx, but the one program I, I showed, Ann Lopers, that, that was developed by Ann at University of Virginia. It's administered and facilitated by clinical psychologists or clinical psychology doctoral students. Um, so, and it's, a, I believe, a uh, CB cognitive behavioral approach. So I've, I should have given that some more details. That one of the best examples, it, uh, other than Marx. So I, I appreciate your comments, and it is, it is true that the problem that I'm talking about today does cross over any area of social need that we have, and that again goes back to the triage question, which is another reason why I brought that up, is that the people who have the ability to fund the work that we all do in whatever area it is are also making triage decisions, and the question is what drives those? I mean, I know often what drives policy is, well, my mother had Alzheimer's, or my father was in prison, or whatever, and now I'm a legislator and I'm going to push a bill. Or in Oregon, I had to take eight hours of training in pen ma pain meds because some legislator you know, had, an, had a uh, family member who passed away. is very sad, and so everybody takes training in, in pain medication to, to do better in our own practices. It's all important, but again, it's a piecemeal process. It's not stepping back and thinking, where do we go? I, I, could talk on the question that goes to your question and also your statement is that um, in my own work, when I first started working in prisons, it was somewhat inadvertent. I had been working in juvenile justice and I had a longitudinal sample and the kids grew up. And I was talking with some folks from um, um, not rem an institute in New York City that I'm not remembering right now who had come to visit us, and they were saying, what do you know about incarcerated dads? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know, you know? And then I went and looked in the sample, and like 60% of the guys in there were incarcerated dads. And a week later, I heard from the criminal justice system in Oregon that they were starting a new um, task force on on working with incarcerated parents, and I thought, well, there's something in the air here. I better get going to that task force. So anyway, that's how I got into this back in 1999. But the work that we did uh, at that point, it was depressing what I found, and what we did to develop the program, the parenting program that I've, one of the programs I've been involved with, is that we uh, started by talking to incarcerated dads and incarcerated moms over a long period of time. And in fact, the reason I was with those dads who were lifers that day was that we were piloting a program and they were uh, important consumers because if they felt like this program had value, they would tell people about it and people would come. And if they felt like it was not valuable, they wouldn't. And so part of the social structure was to get approval of that group of folks in this prison. So anyway, but, uh, but along the way of developing that, it was very important for us. And we took about four years to develop this and we, our program, and we uh, had voices from incarcerated mothers and fathers and caregivers of their kids and practitioners who were already working in the system and scholars. And so we tried to bring all of those voices together at once, and I do think that that type of effort is needed. And, uh, uh, and also the other thing that we did in that particular work is that it was initiated because the correction system was interested. And so the first thing that I said when they said, would you work with us, I said, let's split the cost. I'll try to find half the cost. You try to find half the cost. Let's be partners from the beginning to, do, to create this and not have it all be driven on any single funding source. And so we did that. It was driven by private funding, by state legislature funding, as well as by federal funding that we all had to piece together over the years of the study. So anyway, I, my point is that the more voices that we can bring to the table, the more funders that we can bring to the table, the more we can mix those, and the more advocates that we could bring to the table because we also brought in uh, folks in our state who are advocating. And so all of those different voices give a different point of view and challenge us as scholars to think differently and to think about issues, whether it's, you know, what is my 
what is my identity as a man or as a father or as anything that I identify myself as being in the context of a system where you have no identity. It's, it's you know, so I, I don't know. But the, the issues that are coming up here are very important. And I know that we're supposed to have a break probably right now. And so five minutes? Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> My turn. Okay, can I ask a question? Um, so forgive me too, because this is a neophyte's perspective because I'm new to the space, so it's almost more of a wondering than anything else. Um, but knowing what we know just from all of these different areas of the literature and theoretically, that we know that we're talking about a comprehensive approach that needs to be implemented. It needs to be the whole family. It needs to be all of the caregivers who are involved. It really needs to be um, systemic in that respect. And going back to the caregiver, you know, at, at home, they play such a huge role in how the child is going to do. If you want to know how a child is doing, you look at their caregiver and you see how they're doing. And we know that that has implications then, not only in their relationship, but it has implication probably for re-entry, because if we've been supporting that caregiver the entire time, then there's probably going to be more of an openness in terms of their, sorry, I'll use a reintegration term, you know, from the military. But again, um, I think a lot of that we, we find in that uh, military literature that has implications for this work. So I'm, I'm, wondering, knowing, recognizing the funding that's involved in such a comprehensive approach and recognizing that funders really don't want to uh, pay for that and certainly not the evaluation, how often is it that the bottom line kind of variables, such as recidivism, such as the cost to the state, how often is that paired with the family programs and the family outcomes? And is that something, I mean, obviously we have to look to see if that's theoretically making sense, that there would be uh, less recidivism if you have a stronger family system and you have more family resilience in play, and it's not taking care of the institutional barriers that uh, lead to incarceration. But if there is that connection there, if we're including those variables as well that make the happy and makes the state happy, um, you know, what's going on in, in, in that area of the work? Is that being done? Well, uh, so I'm kind of, a, you know, go back a ways on this decades, but, you know, when, when this work, um, the, the main attraction to this work by most politicians that I met is not the parents, it's the kids. And, um, and it's really this myth that these kids are not resilient and that they're going to go to prison too. And I think we've talked a bit today that most kids of incarcerated parents are doing okay, but some are not. But there is a belief that most of them will end up in prison and that that's false. But that really, in, in, in terms of what we know so far, we know that having a parent in prison is a risk for child antisocial behavior, we know that, and there's been good work done on that, but in terms of how many end up incarcerated or the, or the percentages that end up incarcerated, I think that question has not been answered very well. So anyway, I think uh, a driving issue for a lot of folks about this is, you know, it's all about the kids, we need to help these kids. And, um, and in a way, that's kind of wiped out the question that you just asked about the cost benefit ratio or some kind of cost analysis of this kind of work. Um, I think in my own work, one of the reasons some of the papers that I just need to get out one of these days that are written but need to be submitted are around go to the issue of recidivism because that's where the system is and not on these soft kind of issues that we're talking about, you know. And so if we can't answer that question for a lot of these systems, they don't really care that much. As individuals, they care, but as a system, they don't care, I think, because that's not, they're, they're charged with other types of tasks. So I haven't seen a very good, I haven't seen a, an analysis on this issue. What I have heard lately, and this has been brewing for years, is this, you know, social improvement bonding kind of issue, right, where you 
you know, get people to invest in some program because then you aren't going to end up with as many people having to be locked up, for example. And so I've heard people kind of spinning that, but they're not really spinning it with data that's solid yet. But I do think if, you know, it turns out in this country that that social improvement bonding thing works in a couple of examples, maybe it will take off more and maybe the data will be collected to kind of get to your answer to your question, but I don't know. But other people know about this in this room. What, what do you all think about this answer, question to this? Great time. Yeah, great time. Okay. <laughs>